Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa. I'm James Creedon. Here are our headlines from across the continent this evening. Now, tensions remain high in Uganda one week before President uh, Yoweri Museveni will seek re-election. There have been brutal crackdowns on opposition rallies in recent weeks. Uh, more on that coming up. And in DR Congo, 20 years on from the assassination of President Laurent Kabila, one man sentenced to death for his role in the shooting has been set free. This uh, after other political prisoners were also granted freedom. We'll take a closer look at that. And China's foreign minister is currently on a tour of five African countries. It's become a tradition for Beijing to send its top diplomat to Africa on his first foreign trip of the year. We'll get some analysis of that. Thanks for watching Eye on Africa. Now we start in Uganda where it's been a choppy few weeks uh, for those uh, seeking to defeat President Yoweri Museveni uh, in next week's vote. The main opposition leader, Bobby Wine, has said he will call on the International Criminal Court to probe murder, torture and other abuses in the country. The pop star turned politician has been arrested multiple times. Meanwhile, Uganda's police chief has stated that the beating of reporters covering opposition campaigns is, quote, for their own good. Laurent Berstecker has all the latest. A picture worth a thousand words. Ugandan opposition leader Bobby Wine was denouncing systematic abuses by security forces during a press conference from inside his car when he was violently arrested by police. As you can see, I'm being arrested. I am back again. I'm sorry, I've been tear gas in my car. Um, the police officer is ordering that I'm not supposed to park on the side of the road and speak to media. A scene that illustrates the harassment and provocations which Bobby Wine has been facing on a regular basis for the past few months. On Thursday, the Ugandan opposition leader petitioned the International Criminal Court to investigate alleged acts of torture, intimidation and murder by Yoweri Museveni's government. The complaint details a history of torture, physical abuse of Bobby Wine and other political figures, particularly those associated with him. Since he entered politics in 2017, former reggae singer Bobby Wine has been arrested multiple times. His run-ins with police have intensified in recent months as Uganda's presidential elections draw near. His arrest on November 18th sparked anger and outrage among his supporters, who took to the streets to call for his release. Security forces responded with live rounds, killing 54 people. Bobby Wine, who now wears a helmet and a bulletproof vest, says he's begun to fear for his life. On Thursday, he evacuated his immediate family to the United States. Congolese authorities have released Eddie Kapend, a man once sentenced to death for his role in the assassination of President Laurent Kabila nearly two decades ago. Kabila was killed by one of his bodyguards at the presidential palace in Kinshasa in January 2001. The news comes just days after all political prisoners in the country serving sentences of over 20 years were pardoned. Let's take a listen to some reactions. Yeah, there has been a presidential pardon. I'm one of the beneficiaries. I'd like to thank the President of the Republic, God, as well as the rule of law. We need to know who did what. I've spent 7,338 days in prison. We must know the truth. Who killed Kabila? I'm very proud to see Eddie Kapend released today. I encourage the head of state to pursue this direction. We want democracy to prevail here. As for Eddie Kapend, may his trial resume so that the truth be restored, so his rights are restored. Time now for some other news stories in brief from across the continent. A jihadist attack in northern Cameroon has left 13 people dead. A woman who blew herself up caused those fatalities. The far north of Cameroon is grappling with deadly incursions linked to the Boko Haram insurgency in neighbouring Nigeria. The Ethiopian army says it has killed four senior members of the Tigray region's ruling party. They were targeted in a military offensive, according uh, to state-affiliated media. Uh, the former director of the Ethiopian Broadcasting Authority and a journalist close to the party were also killed. Fighting in Tigray has left thousands dead and sent tens of thousands of refugees streaming across the border into Sudan. 
Zimbabwean journalist and government critic Hopewell Chinono was arrested on Friday on charges of communicating false information. His third arrest in, in six months. Uh, Chinono, who has a large social media, fo media following, has been critical of President uh, Emerson Emengagwa's rule, accusing his government of corruption and mismanagement. Now, for the past 30 years, China has sent its foreign minister to Africa for his first trip of the new year. 2021 is no exception. Wang Yi is currently on a tour of Nigeria, DR Congo, Botswana, Tanzania and the Seychelles. Now, earlier I spoke to Deborah Brautigam, the director of the China Africa Research Initiative at Johns Hopkins University's SAIS School. I started by asking about how China is transforming economies across Africa. Well, many people think that the largest sector of Chinese engagement in Africa is in mining or oil, and that's actually not the case. It is um, oil and minerals are a very large portion of Chinese trade with Africa. But in terms of Chinese business engagement, it's really the construction industry. And Africa makes up um, about 30 percent of, of China's global construction industry business. A lot of this is uh, is financed by African governments. But the Chinese have committed about $148 billion uh, to these construction projects across Africa. And that's a very visible uh, symbol of that engagement. And you can see it everywhere um, in every country. It's in buildings, government buildings, it's in roads. About 70% of that loan finance goes into electricity, transport, and water and telecoms. So those four areas of infrastructure financed by Chinese loans. But it's really African government investment, of course, because those loans need to be repaid. Let's talk about debt relief for a moment, because that's another big subject uh, concerning many, many African countries. Now, there has been some talk of debt relief uh, by the World Bank, but for now, many African countries remain caught up in those debt, debt traps, really. Now, China lends almost as much as the World Bank, but Beijing has just cancelled a part of the debt owed to DR Congo. Now, how significant is that decision? This is um, something that Chinese have done since 2000. So for the past 20 years, they have um, regularly cancelled a portion of their bilateral uh, debt, which is a very small portion of the overall debt. But this is a uh, debt that is uh, zero interest foreign aid loans. So these are are really much more akin to the highly indebted poor countries, the HIPIC program that the West uh, undertook in the late 1990s to cancel their debt. So the Chinese followed that in 2000, and they continue to do that almost every year. So that's that debt. It's zero interest loans. It's just a small uh, part of what the Congo owes to China. It's really not very significant. It's significant only as a diplomatic measure. OK. Now, some political leaders and, and workers have criticised uh, Beijing for ignoring environmental standards in, in quite a vast array of examples, violating uh, local laws, other kind of exploitative kinds of behaviour. Now, should Africans be a little bit concerned about a certain attitude of impunity? The Chinese government, um, I think, defers more to local laws. So, for example, in financing infrastructure projects, they would um, defer to the local government in terms of their standards, environmental standards, and they would expect the local government to enforce whatever standards they have. And so in that sense, those standards are usually a lot weaker than those we have in the West or those that we use for the projects that we finance or that Europeans finance. So they could be criticized for that. Um, okay, I'll just, I'll, just many... because we're running out of time, I'll move on to another point that I think is really uh, important to touch on before uh, we, we have to wrap up. The, the, the attitude, of course, of non-interference in internal affairs of African countries. That's China's position for uh, a long time. Uh, yet, right now, they have more than peacekeepers on the ground across Africa than any, uh, twice as many, in fact, uh, than any other uh, member of the uh, UN Security Council. So uh, can, is that tenable, that attitude of non-interference? Well, so far we've seen no evidence that they are going to use these peacekeepers to actually uh, interfere in what's happening in the countries. Um, and I think 2,000 peacekeepers across all of Africa is really not very many. We might see these peacekeepers as getting some experience because the Chinese uh, haven't fought overseas since 1979 when they invaded Vietnam. Um, but by and large, I think they're going. They're, it's more of a soft power. Um, something that they do under UN auspices. And so they're trying to get uh, 
appreciation for this rather than to use this to as a means to um, interfere, to intervene, or to invade. Now, we'll finish with a little fact or fake segment here on Eye on Africa. Take a look at these pictures that went viral in August of last year. Now, many took the images to be real. Uh, they showed tiny giraffes around the size of dogs scurrying around. Now, many were fooled, but obviously these pictures were fake. But it did introduce the idea of small giraffes. And it turns out it is a real thing. Scientists were surprised in recent years to discover two dwarf giraffes, one in Namibia and one in Uganda. This guy looks uh, very young, maybe like at the age of maybe a one-year-old uh, giraffe, but he is in fact fully grown. Now, most giraffes grow up to about six metres tall, but uh, this adult giraffe in Namibia measures about a third of that size. Let's take a listen to the co-founder of the Giraffe Cons Conservation Foundation. It looks like a, a very young one-year-old giraffe. So, yeah, we were definitely all very surprised to see it uh, and then went about doing a little bit of research to figure out uh, what was going on. Unfortunately, we'd probably need to do some genetic work if we want to understand more, but we can definitely tell that it is a dwarf giraffe. There you go, fantasy and reality merging on Eye in Africa. Tonight's show was produced by Maya yet again. Uh, thanks for watching. Do stay tuned.